Amen. Romans chapter 3. So keep your place there. We'll get there in just a few minutes. So this morning we're going to talk, um, actually this morning and tonight and then really the next two weeks, um, we're going to talk about uh, relationships. We're going to talk about relationships um, in the Sunday morning service uh, this morning, tonight. Um, we're, we're starting a, a sermon series about relationships. And then um, next week we'll finish that sermon series and also have another sermon Sunday morning about relationships. So basically the title of the sermon this morning is a short list, a short list. So this morning I want to talk about how to have relationships that last for the long haul. So you say, how, what do you mean by that? The average, if you look up just studies on just friendships, I mean, not, obviously there's many more important relationships in our lives than just friendships, but if you look up you know, just secular studies on friendships, the average friendship is about seven years um, for people. You know, I mean, it would be nice to have friends longer than seven years. I mean, wouldn't you say? I mean, if you could find a way to have relationships that lasted your whole life, just imagine the impact that that would have on you. Imagine the impact that it would have on, I don't know, like how about your marriage? You know, it would have a great impact on your marriage. It would have a great impact on your church life. Um, church life studies are, are, are similar. There's about, you know, when you look at, you know, studies on especially Baptists and how long people stay with the same church, um, you look at, you're looking at about 40 to 50 percent of people that, can, that stay in the same church for more than 20 years. And for some reason, I mean, I think I understand what this reason is, but it seems that the older people get, the more, the, the better they are at staying in the same church, which it makes sense. The older you get, um, the more stable you are um, in your life, hopefully. You know, that seems to be the trend. But just imagine if you could have relationships, a marriage, a church life that just lasted your whole life. I mean, how great would that be? The thing is, the Bible tells us how we can accomplish this. And it's not a complicated thing. So, first of all, you're in Romans chapter 3. If we look, if you follow everything that is, is preached from the Bible this Sunday and next Sunday, you will have relationships that last your whole life. You will have a marriage that lasts your whole life. You will have a church life that lasts your whole life. And you will have friends that last your whole life if you can do these things. Right? They're very simple things, but for some reason, you know, the flesh gets in the way and people make mistakes in this path. And this is why people have, you know, friends that don't last their whole life and things like this. Go to Romans chapter 3. So I'm gonna, we're talking about a short list. That's the title of the sermon this morning. I'm going to show you how to have relationships that last, you know, longer than seven years this morning. But first of all, we need a problem statement. Before we can solve something, you know, we need to understand what the problem is. In Romans chapter 3, if you're a soul winner, you know exactly what I'm talking about with these verses. Look at verse number 10. In Romans chapter 3. So we're going to define the problem first of all. Here's the problem that you're going to run into in all of your relationships. I don't care what relationship we're talking about, you're going to run into these problems. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Nobody is righteous. Meaning, you know, righteous meaning you do right all the time, or, or a lot of people will define it as perfect. You never make a mistake. All right, look at Romans 3. Verse number 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, what are you trying to tell me, Pastor? I already know this. I already know these things. It's obvious that everybody's a sinner. It's obvious that nobody is perfect. Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. In this life, with these people, you say, what people? All the people. <laughs> With all the people that you're going to deal with in your life, all the people, you know, what about this church? Yeah, the people in this church. All the people in this church, including and up to the pastor and the pastor's wife and the pastor's family, are sinners. They are not righteous. They, they, they go wrong all the time, okay? They say, what does that mean? It means they say and do the wrong things, basically, to just sum it up. So we're dealing with all these people in our lives. It's kind of like, it's like an equation where every variable is moving. Where every variable is, is, is not constant. Like, you're not righteous. People you deal with, people you're friends with are not righteous. We're all sinners. But look, 
This is, this is cause and effect is what I'm talking to you about this morning. The cause, the cause is that we're all unrighteous, we're all sinners. The effect is that there's going to be conflict. That, that's the effect. It's, you know, cause and effect, like, you know, Johnny took a cookie. So Johnny, the effect, the cause is Johnny took a cookie, the effect is Johnny got a spanking. Right? A simple cause and effect. Because we are all imperfect, we are all sinners, there is going to be conflict in our relationship. And look, especially in a church, because we spend a lot of time together in this church. We, we go, come to church three times a week. We hang out for hours, talking many times till late in the night. And look, there's just, there's just going to be conflict, you know, when you have relationships where there's so much time spent together. Meaning people are going to say and do things that offend you. It's very, very simple. Someone's going to, you know, someone's going to insult you at some point in your life, you know, either directly or indirectly. You know, maybe there's like these people that gaslight you. They're insulting you and, and, and like they're not directly insulting you. It's it gaslighting is where you're like, is, is, was that a shot at me? You know, when people are making comments and just like, is he insulting me? Is he insulting me by that comment? You'd be shocked how many times people do this to a pastor, actually. <laughs> I mean, it happens to me quite a bit. But, you know, some, maybe it's just something simple, like somebody says something in a group of friends that they think is really funny, but you don't think it's funny. You know, you're like, that's not funny. You know, maybe it was at your expense, it offended you. Maybe somebody does something, you know, you get to be good friends with somebody, and maybe you go into business, or you do something where you're, you're, you're trading services or something. Somebody does something that ends up costing you money. Ends up costing you, you know, they borrow something, and then they, they don't pay you back, or maybe somebody even just outright just steals from you. I mean, these types of things are going to happen in relationships in your life. They, they borrow something and they wreck it or whatever. I mean, these are the types of things that are going to happen to you in relationships in your life. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So you don't have to have something like this happen to you and be like, oh, man, ah, I have to nuke the world because this happened to me. No, this happens to everybody because everybody's a sinner. And everybody is dealing with sinners. So how do we get along? How could you possibly, when you're dealing with people like this, when I say people like this, I mean people in general. That's what Romans chapter 3 is telling us. It's saying all people are like this. All people are going to do things that are wrong. How do we get along? How do we have relationships that last longer than this seven years that is the average today? You know, many people don't have any friends at all. But people that have friends, the average is seven years, especially in a church, which is, what is my goal. My goal would be that everybody in this church it has friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, and they are like that forever. I know that that's not going to happen, you know, 100%, but the higher the percentage of that is, the more successful I feel like I am as a, as a church leader. That's what I want. That's my goal. That's why sermons like this need to be, probably be preached more, not less. Because so many people, I mean, think about, think about just from my perspective. You know, I mean, as far as, you know, offending people and having people, you know, having relationships, I want to have a good relationship with everybody in the church. But, I mean, here I am, I preach 150 plus sermons a year. And many of the sermons I, I preach are actually sermons that people don't necessarily want to hear all the time. <laughs> you know, that's quite a spot to be in for me. I mean, so look, but the point I'm trying to make is this. With relationships in our lives, it is a matter of if, not when, somebody will offend you or upset you or wrong you in some way. Right? I'm not even saying that, like, you know, you're, that it could be a legitimate wrong. It is just a matter of time. It is going to happen. And then what happens in that case is that people end up building a list against people. People end up building a list of offenses that people have done to them. So the title of the sermon, as I said, is a short list. So I'm going to show you from the Bible this morning how to keep that short list. And more importantly, really, how to clear that list. Because the Bible teaches us two very simple steps on how to have a clear list with people. If you want to have friends, 
If you want to have a friend that is a great friend for the rest of your life, your list with that friend will be clear. And at any moment in time, it will at least be very short and then hopefully cleared very quickly using this method. If you look, you want to have a great marriage, you will have a short list and you will have a clear list with your spouse. All right, so let's look at this process and see what the Bible has to say. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This, you have, when it comes to someone offending you, somebody doing wrong, and I don't care who it is, I don't care if it's your friend, your brother, your sister, if it's your pastor, if it's your spouse, I don't care who it is. You have two choices when somebody offends you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's look at the first choice. So we're looking at how to keep a short list with people. And not only have that short list, but how to clear that list with people. Because when you end up with a long list against somebody, that is when relationships end. And that is why people don't have relationships beyond just a few years. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now keep in mind that Paul is writing this letter to a church in Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 1. The Bible says this, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, here we have some conflict, right here, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Here you had these people in this church. You say, oh man, there's, you know, there's, been, con there's been conflict in churches since the beginning of churches. And here was a, a church where these people had matters against each other. And what were they doing? They were suing each other. They were taking church members to like, the judge, to the, the Gentiles, the, you know, the Romans. I mean, they were literally suing. And he's like, why in the world would you be doing this? He's like, this is not what you should do. He's like, don't you know that the saints, he's like, the people in your church are going to be judging, you know, they're going to be ruling during the millennial reign with Christ. He's like, don't you think that they can handle these small, silly little matters amongst yourself? Don't you think that they, he's basically saying that, don't you think Christians have better judgment than just like the worldly secular authorities out there? He's like, what are you doing? Look at this, verse 4. If you then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, he's saying matters of, he's not talking about doctrine. He's not talking about, you know, the gospel. He's talking about just like, just matters that pertaining to this life, material things, you know, um, silly arguments. He says, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He's like, you are better, you'd be better off taking the, the least reliable person the person with the worst reputation in the church then, and, and letting them judge the matter than going to the outside authorities. I mean, that is 100% true. I mean, who in the world would listen to, like, the judgment of, especially, you know, a, a secular government? I mean, what in the world, right? He's like, I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you? Know you not that, that, that one shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brother, go to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. It's like these people were suing each other, taking their business to the unbelievers. Look at verse number seven. Now he gives them the solution. Here's the first best solution when you have conflict with somebody, especially in the church. He says, now therefore, there's utterly a fault among you. He's not, he's not denying the fact that there's actually something that's been done wrong. There's a fault. He says, but, you know, the fault now that you have is that you're suing each other. He says, because you go to law with one another. He's like, now, like, you all have problems, regardless of who is right or wrong in that situation. He's saying, you're, you're at fault. You're all at fault now because, you know, you're suing each other. He says, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So that's the first method right there. Somebody offends you in the church. Paul is just saying, I have those two words underlined in my Bible. He says, the first best thing that you can do it's just take wrong. What's that mean? He's, he's saying just, and then he defines it later as suffer yourself to be defrauded, he says. Now what that means is to just, you know what it means? It means, it means just let it go. It's, it's matters of this life. It's matters of this life. It's either material things or your emotions or whatever. He's like the best thing that you could do. Choice number one to keep a short list for people and look, if you can just do this with everything, you'll have a clear list with people. 
He's saying, you know what? He's like, just let it go. He's like, just suffer yourself to be defrauded. You know, no, look, some people, some people are offended by everything. There's actually a term for an entire generation of people called the snowflake generation. Like, you can look it up, and like, it's a, it's a defined generation, you know, term at this point of basically anybody that became an adult after 2010. So 2010, 2011, and on, if you became an adult at that point, like this, there's just this generation. They just can't handle anything. They're offended by everything. Everything offends them. This is the advice that that generation needs to take. You know what? Take wrong. Take wrong. I mean, look, it's all about, look, the, the problem with the snowflake generation and people that are offended by literally everything is that they will achieve nothing. Because it's always somebody that did them wrong. It's always somebody else you know, it's always what they didn't get. It's always, you know, how they were disadvantaged according to what somebody did to them. You know, it's, it's like this, this whole snowflake thing and being offended by everything is a disease unto itself. So the Bible says the best thing you can do when somebody offends you is just take wrong. That's it. Right? Because what, this, what, what being a snowflake actually does and what it actually means is that by just blaming everything and being offended by everything, what it really translates to is that you take responsibility for nothing. Is that nothing is ever your fault. You know, this is the person that's just making excuse after excuse after excuse for every single failure that they have. So we shouldn't be that person, all right? As far as, you know, getting offended, we shouldn't just, you know, you should ask yourself, you know, do I get offended by it too much? If you're just constantly offended, by people, you're constantly just like, this person offended me, and this person offended me, and you're constantly being offended by people wherever you go, not just at church, at work, other places. Look, you might be a snowflake. And it's a major problem, because look, that means, you know what that means? It means you don't have the ability to do what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You don't have the ability to take wrong. You don't have the ability to let things go. Now look, Letting it go, let me just say, taking wrong, suffering yourself to be defrauded means, like, we have to first understand what that means, too. That means not letting it stack up. That means deleting it. That means delete key. That's what that means. It doesn't mean going to other people being like, this person did this to me, but I'm just going to suffer myself to be defrauded. And you go and just talk a bunch of trash about what somebody did to you, but then I'm just going to suffer myself to be defrauded. No, you're not suffering yourself to be defrauded. You're, you're doing what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But suffering yourself to be defrauded means you shut up and you let it go. That's what it means. It means, it means you take the wrong. You don't go and spread a bunch of trash saying, ah, oh, I'm just, and then people are like, oh, you're such a great you know, spiritual person that you're, you're suffering. No, it means you be quiet and you just let it go. You take the wrong. You see, I can't do that. This particular case, I just, I can't do it. I can't let it go. I, I, I don't have the ability to do that. Maybe it's a weakness that I have, you say. Maybe it's just like, I feel like the offense was so great that I need to deal with it. Well, there's another option in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. You see, I can't let it go. Now, Matthew chapter 18, and I will preach about this till I'm blue in the face, but it is the most simple, consistent doctrine in the Bible from Jesus, by the way, from Jesus himself that Christians routinely ignore. And the results, look, the results, if they ignore this, are absolutely devastating. They're devastating to the person that ignores it, and many times they're devastating to many people around them that they involve as well. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse number 15. So obviously the first best option if somebody offends you is to just let it go, suffer yourself to be defrauded. The second one is this. Look at Matthew chapter 18. If you say, I, I just can't do that. I can't do that in this case. It, it's just too great. I feel like, you know, if, if I just let it go, it's not gonna help things, that it's a big problem. Well, look at Matthew chapter 18, verse number 15. The Bible says, Jesus says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee 
and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. Now notice something here. Notice something in this verse. It says, first of all, somebody really trespassed against you. It's assuming that like you've been done wrong here. So somebody came and they did me wrong or they did you wrong. The Bible is saying, hey, you know, that's fine. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him. Now, wouldn't it just be good enough to say between thee and him? Wouldn't it be good enough to just say, hey, go and tell him his fault between thee and him? Why put that extra word in there? That extra word in there is there to make a point. That extra word is there to show you how important it is that you go to that individual person that offended you and you go and you tell him alone. It is saying tell him and, and just like alone. Not, not go to 50 other people and then go to him or her or whatever. It's saying, look, it's like, it's fine. If somebody trespassed against you, I get it. That's going to happen is what Jesus is saying here. He's like, it's easy to solve. He's like, you go straight to him alone. There's not a bunch of people around. It's just you go up to your brother and you just tell them, hey, you know, brother, you offended me. And look, and it, and it says here, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, look, here's the thing. You know, it, it doesn't mean you go around to uh, 20 people lobbying your case before you do this. You don't go around, you know, campaigning. Look, this is a cultural thing today. This is a cultural thing that people think is normal. People think it is normal to have somebody wrong them and to just go around and tell everybody else how somebody wronged them. It's normal. I brought up, uh, you know, it's, it's in like, there used to be a TV show called Survivor. I, maybe there still is, I don't know, but they, that's what they, they encourage that there. You go around and you talk behind people's back and you, you come up with, you know, different things to, you know, there, there's, it's a cultural thing. Like people literally, like I will like, you know, there's, this is a common thing with like, um, you know, in, in the workplace, I, I've done this for years and years and years. Whenever somebody is, is texting or emailing somebody and, you know, if, if that, that conversation goes awry in some way where there's some kind of, you know, perceived conflict in that email conversation, the advice I will always give to that person is whenever you think that there's a conflict through email, you get up and you go talk to that person directly. No more emails, no more texts. It's like you're just doing business between email and all of a sudden like, whoa, what was that all about? Get up and go talk to them immediately. Because many, I mean that, but, but that's not the culture today. The culture today is to go and, and, and tell coworkers and be like, you believe this guy sent me this email? What in the world? You believe this? You believe this email? I mean, do you believe the tone of this? First of all, like texts and emails can just be completely misunderstood. You know, I, I had a, a what, you, know, we, I, you know, sometimes you're just like having a com complicated conversation with somebody. It's better just pick up the phone. You know, because it's hard to explain certain things. But the problem is, the problem is if you get this wrong, even though the culture is saying that you should do it this way today, if you get this wrong, and you go the way the culture is, it will destroy relationships. This is the problem. See, because people today, I think it's our technological culture as well, with texts and emails. People are so brave at it behind a keyboard today. People are so brave, you know, with their phone and their thumbs and with their keyboard. You know, people are so brave, but they're really adverse to talking to people face to face. They're really nervous and they really don't like doing that. It's really easy to trash people on a screen with, with a text message or email. And it's really easy to misunderstand people in, in those types of communication as well. People just have this, you know, this adverse reaction to going and getting up and talking to somebody face to face. And it's a problem. Because what does the Bible say that you must do as soon as you're offended? If you're offended and you can't let it go, what, what must you do immediately? You must go talk to them face to face. You must go address it to them. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. So just because people consider this behavior normal today, you cannot let yourself fall into this. Because if you do, it will ruin your relationships in your life. 
And more, much more than that, it will damage and hurt many other people. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And here's the thing. Here's, here's, the, here's the silly thing about it. It makes no logical sense. If you're a logical person, just think this through with me. Somebody does you wrong. Somebody, let me, Matthew 18 says, you know, somebody trespassed against you. You legitimately have a beef with this person. And you've decided, look, and it's your, it's your right to say, I'm not going to suffer myself to, to be defrauded on this. It is your right to follow Matthew chapter 18 and go talk to this person. So you've been trespassed against. Somebody's done you wrong, okay? Now, you're going to go and you're going to act in such a way where you become a sinner, where you become a sinner in the situation. Of course, you're a sinner, but I mean, the point is, you're going to make yourself at fault. I have no fault if somebody trespasses against me. I have no fault if somebody does me wrong or offends me. I have no fault there, but I can act in such a way where I become at fault. Does that make sense? Why in the world would you ever want to do that? I mean, it's like you get, in a, you, you get in an argument with your spouse. Let me give you a, a hypothetical situation. I've never actually been in an argument with my spouse because I'm the pastor and my marriage is perfect. But let's just say that you get in an argument with your spouse. And let's say your spouse like legitimately did something that offended you. Like, not that my wife would ever do that or I would ever do that to her. It's never happened in 23 years. I can't even say it with a straight face. But let's say that you're, one of the, the spouse legitimately offends you. And then you just get, like, upset, and, and you just, like, fly off the handle and, and, like, you know, tell a friend or something. It's like, now you're at fault. Now you have something. Now she could be offended or I could be offended in the situation. And now, see, you don't want to do this because now there's more things to work out. Now I'm building a list. She's building a list. We're both building lists. Neither of us are following, you know, the process of the Bible. And, like, these lists just keep growing. Look, it's a snowball effect that will just destroy, and it destroys relationships. It destroys relationships. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you don't follow Matthew 18 exactly and go to thee and him alone, look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 15. It says, it says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's affairs, in other men's matters, sorry. What you've done is not only have you made yourself at fault by not going to them alone, but now you have in involved some other innocent person in your mess. Because here's another cultural thing that's, that's, that's quite wrong in our culture today, and I'm, I'm sure cultures from the beginning of time. People love to hear about other people's garbage. It's just like a sin nature thing. I don't know what it is. So when somebody comes and they want to tell you a bunch of trash about somebody else, people are like, oh, because I don't know if it makes them feel better or, or what it does. But people love to, now they are involved in that. Now they are in, they're complicit in this, this sin that you have now started, even when you were wronged. You were wronged at the beginning. Now you're, now you're, you're starting to sin yourself in the situation and what's worse is you're involving other people in your sin. You see how terrible this is? You see how this can grow and just get completely out of control? I mean, somebody comes to you and you're like, so-and-so wronged me. So-and-so wronged me. And they haven't talked to the other person about it. They're literally, if somebody comes to you and says that, they're literally trying to make you a sinner in the situation. Please remember that. That's why, like, you know, the advice should always be, like, have you, you know, just be a brother that is sharpening his brother. A brother that somebody comes to you and says, so-and-so wronged me and so-and-so offended me. Brother, you should go and talk to him immediately about that. You should go and just, just, just refer him to Matthew 18. And just, brother, you should, you should not be going telling people, just go and talk to him about it. Just talk to him about it. But, you know, funny thing is, many times people get this wrong on purpose. People do this wrong on purpose because they want to hurt the person that wronged them. You know, they want to just like, it's basically a way, turn to Proverbs chapter 26, it's basically a way for them to get back. They don't want to fix the situation, they just want to get back at the person that they feel trespassed against them. And look, it's a really evil thing to do that. It's called being a talebearer. And the Bible talks about being a talebearer all over the Bible. But look at this, 
in Proverbs chapter 26, verse number 22, to back up my point that I'm trying to get you to understand that by, by not following Matthew 18 exactly and not going to him alone and involving other people, the damage that you do by becoming a talebearer, because that's what you just did, you just became a talebearer. Look at Proverbs 26, verse 22. The Bible says, Proverbs 26 and verse number 22. The Bible says the words of a talebearer, that is you. If you are not following Matthew 18 and you are going campaigning and gossiping and trying to get people on your side from someone that you believe trespassed against you, you are a talebearer. And look what the Bible says. It says the words of a talebearer are as wounds. You know what that means? It means they hurt people intentionally. They're wounding people. Look what it says. And they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. What this say, says is that they're doing great damage to people. These words that you're speaking by being a talebearer. So, I mean, think about how logically stupid this is. If you're like just legitimately wanting to have good relationships, somebody's going to offend you in your life. I'm going to offend you. Guaranteed. I'm going to say the wrong, look, I may legitimately offend you. Like, I may, like, legitimately say something from the pulpit. My wife was just reading, uh, we were reading through Acts the other day, and, and it came up to the story of, uh, of Dorcas. Uh, you know, I kind of had some fun with that name when I preached that, and, and, and the Bible said that Dorcas was a disciple, and, and my wife's like, I thought you said, like, during the sermon that, like, she wasn't saved or something. And I'm like, I never would have said that. Why would I have said that? And I, like, I was going to get her. You know, I was going to prove her wrong. And I went back to my sermon, and I made some comment in the sermon. Like, after Dorcas got um, raised from the dead, you know, I was like, hey, maybe you know, she went on to do even greater things, and maybe if she wasn't saved, she got saved. And I'm just like, I mean, I'm like, I don't know why I would have said that, because like it says she's a disciple, which means I assume she's saved. But here's the thing, like, I don't know, I say some things that I, you just say stuff, you know. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you can, I can, but it's kind of nice that she remembered that little tiny little snippet. Like, it was one sentence, you know, she's like, I'm offended. And I'm like, I'm just kidding. She wasn't offended. But I mean, the point is, is like you get up and you preach and you say things. And sometimes like, you know, maybe you say the wrong thing. I mean, it's possible. Why? Because I'm a sinner. That's why. Because I'm not perfect, I'm not righteous, just like you're not perfect. Obviously, I mean, if I'm up here just preaching false doctrine, I mean, that's a whole other story. I'm not, you know, trying to excuse anything, any pastor that would do that. But the point is, people, I don't even know where I was going with this, but the point is, people do stuff wrong, and they could legitimately say things that upset you. Why turn yourself into a sinner, into a talebearer that can go and just damage a bunch of people, when the Bible gives you clear direction on how to handle it, on how to handle something like that, right? So look, look at back at Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, if you do do this correctly, if you do do this correctly, here's where it all goes wrong. It, only, it all goes wrong, folks. When it, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong in step one. But if you do it right, and you go to him and him alone 99% of the time, that's it. It's over. And you've what? What does the Bible say you've done? You've gained a brother. You know what that means? It means you're still friends. It means the list, clear. Because, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times when people are offended and they go to somebody that was offended, you know what the reaction is going to be? Many times in my experience, my, my short experience as a pastor, many times the experience is going to be that person is like, oh, I didn't even know. I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't even know. I mean, look, if the person has a hard heart, and they're like, he should have been offended by that, idiot. And then you're like, oh, I'm offended again. <laughs> no, but the point is, 99% of the time, when you have somebody with a right heart that goes to their brother, and somebody with a right heart that receives their brother, and brother one says, hey, you know, when you said this, and I really took that personally, and there was a bunch of people around, and, I, you know, I don't feel like, you know, that was the right thing to say, 99% of the time, it's going to be like, oh, I am so sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize that that was offensive, you know, and I'll be more careful going forward next time, or whatever, right, and then look, the person that, yes, there may be, that's how you also learn who people are as well, because if you have a brother, a friend, or whatever, or even your, your wife, or your husband, 
and they come to you and they say, hey, this one thing really offended you, and you're just like, I had no idea that would offend you. Look, you should, you know, apologize, say you're sorry, but you should also remember in that relationship going forward that, hey, you know, they're very sensitive about these types of things. You know, and look, if, you should figure that out about your wife. You should figure that out about your husband. You know, I, I shouldn't, you know, do these types of things because they offend him or offend her. And look, you're going to have a stronger relationship going forward. You'll have less offenses going forward. Because, of course, friendships, marriages are better off if you have less offenses, not more. You don't want to be the type of husband that's, like, apologizing, like, every single two hours, right? You don't want to be the type of wife that's constantly apologizing, you know, we did, had to do Matthew 18, you know, four times yesterday, and, you know, it's, it's like, and it happens, you know, five times every, every two days. I mean, you don't want to have that type of relationship either, okay? But look at Matthew chapter 18. So the point is this. 99% of the time, the list will be cleared if you do step one correctly. So if you take, let's do some math. You take the fact that maybe you can suffer yourself to be defrauded, you know, 50% of the time, and then 99% of the time, you know, you can, you can clear things with step one. There's going to be like, you know, a very, very small, you know, fraction of 1% of times that you even have to go to step two in Matthew chapter 18. But this is how thorough the Bible is. The Bible gives you clear direction how to handle everything. Look at step two. So you go to your brother, you go to your sister, and you say, look, you offended me. And your brother or your sister, I mean, you know, this is maybe more of a serious thing. Like, okay, maybe you had a business deal in the church and somebody did work on somebody's house and, you know, they didn't pay what they said they were going to pay or, or something, you know, not, not that this should even be something serious, but maybe it's more of a, uh, you know, a, a, a real thing other than just words. But look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. And, and then they meet and, and he says, you know, I, I remodeled your kitchen and you said you would pay me $1,000 and you didn't pay me anything. And then the, the other brother says, well, I don't think that you, know, you did what you're supposed to do, and I'm not paying you anything until you do what you're supposed to do. And there's like a legitimate argument between these two. Neither one is going to say, I'll suffer myself to be defrauded. Neither one, I mean, look, this is a bad situation because apparently that relationship is not worth more than $1,000 to either one of those two people, right? If they're, neither one of them are willing to suffer themselves to be defrauded, which is like, if, if your relationship with somebody isn't worth more than a thousand bucks, maybe you shouldn't risk more than a thousand bucks with that person. You should think about these things. You know, if you, if you have something that is so valuable to you, if I have a tool that is more valuable to me than my friend, I should never borrow that tool to my friend. I mean, that's a pitiful statement in itself, but if I am literally going to, if I know myself well enough to where if I borrowed anything to somebody, it could damage our, our relationship, I would be better off saying, I, I do have that, but I just, I can't go without it. I, I, I can't borrow it to you. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, that would be, look, you're protecting the friendship. If you just know that you're a super materialistic person and just like, you know, don't, don't put your friendships on the line for, for stupid things of what, what did Paul say, of this life. Don't put friendships on the line, like, for that type of stuff. But let's say that you have a legit, you did it, you have a legitimate argument, neither one of you can get, um, can, can figure it out, can get conclusion to it. Look at verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, meaning you don't agree or whatever, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, it's important to know here that this isn't talking about, you know, two or three witnesses is just straight up Bible doctrine. Like, no one can accuse somebody. No one should ever be able to accuse somebody of anything without two or three witnesses. That's in the Levitical law. That's in the New Testament all over the place. It's everywhere, all right? But this is not talking about two or three witnesses that witnessed this offense. They didn't have to be in the circle of people and heard the joke or heard the comment or been involved in the, the house project or whatever. What it's saying is that bring two or three people into the situation to witness every word, meaning to help judge the situation. That's what it's saying. Now look, if this, if this is in a church, that second person should be the pastor or, you know, the pastor's wife. You know, it should be involved. If there's literally an argument in the church, I would like to be that second person. I would like my wife to be that second person to help judge that situation. To what? 
to, to establish every word. That's all. To just hear both sides and to pass some sort of, you know, righteous judgment on the situation. You know, trying to come up with some kind of, basically these people are, you know, mediators. This, this second person, this third person, they're not a witness to the offense, they're just mediators. All right? So look, most conflicts people have, if they're done with the right heart, will not even get to this point. All right? They are easily resolvable. That's what's so silly about the serious damage that can be done if this isn't followed. Because if both people have the right heart, it doesn't even matter really who was at fault at first. It can be easily resolved. Okay? It's when hearts are hard that people won't admit fault, that people go and become a tailbearer. You know, it's this, this pride that we have, and the process is not followed, and disaster strikes. Turn to Matthew chapter 18 again. Look at verse number 17. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 17. But then, you know, obviously if the two or three witnesses, and I've never seen it get to this point, okay? Then if the two or three witnesses can't resolve it, then it'll be brought, tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So somebody stole from somebody in the church. He just will not admit it. It's clear that he stole. Look, it's saying like this person could literally be put out of the church for this, right? It'll never, I mean, it, usually things, people are put out of the church for other things, you know, things go wrong other places before it even gets to verse number 17. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So the point is, really, the two options are go, you know, suffer yourself to be defrauded, like hit the delete key for sure. Select all, delete, right? That's the first option. That's the best option. The second option is going to be go to him and him alone, all right? And that is going to solve 99.9% .9 of all your problems, all your conflicts, in your marriage, in the church, with your friendships, everything. Now, here's another key mistake right here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Here's a key mistake in this process. All right, here's a key mistake. And this key mistake leads to becoming a talebearer, leads to, you know, all the gossip and all the trash and all these things. The question is this, when should this be done? Think about your marriage. Think about your friendships. Think about your relationships in the church. Somebody offends me. When should I take action? When should I take action on step one or step two? When? Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 26. Look what the Bible says. It says, be ye angry and sin not. So it's saying here, be ye angry. Look, does it say never get angry? No. Look, there is legitimate reasons to be angry. How many people think here, when Jesus went into the temple and started throwing over all the money changers' tables, that he was singing hymns and skipping along? He was mad. But he was legitimately mad. It says, be ye angry. It, doesn't this match perfectly what I, I've preached up to this point? It says, be ye angry and sin not. Somebody could legitimately trespass against me. Somebody could legitimately trespass against you, and that could make you angry. And you could be righteously angry. Somebody comes and, and insults my, my wife to my face. I mean, I will be immediately angry if that happens. And you know what? That will be legitimate. But look what the Bible says. It says, be ye angry and sin not. It says, it's okay to be angry, but don't sin when you're angry. It's okay. People are going to offend you. You can get angry, but don't sin. And then it gives us how do, we, how do I not sin? I'm so angry. I just want to, like, strangle somebody. What do I do? But look what it says. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So what the Bible is saying here is when you get angry, in this case, if somebody offends you, somebody causes an offense against you, it's saying you must take care of it right away. You have a problem in your marriage. Your wife offends you. Your husband offends you. Take care of it right away. Don't, don't be mad for a week. Don't be like, hey, I'm not going to speak to that guy for, you know, three weeks. Because then you know what you do? Then you know what you do? Look at the next few verses here. This is so important. You must take care of it right away. Why does the Bible say that? Why can't I be mad at my wife? Like, I feel like I should not have to talk to her for four days for, for what she did to me or what she said to me or whatever. Why does the Bible say that I should not do that. 
The reason is, is because when I get angry, when somebody offends me, when a friend offends me, when a brother in Christ offends me, it doesn't matter. When somebody trespasses against me something, and I get angry, something immediately starts happening. Immediately. This is why the Bible is rightly saying that you must, you must take care of it right away before the sun goes down. That means like now. What if it's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon and somebody offends me? I better get it done right away. It, look, it's, it's, it's a metaphor. It's saying don't, don't hang on to it. Why? Why? Look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. Remember what I've told you so far. Remember what I've told you so far. Look at the, it's not an accident that these verses are just a couple verses later when it's saying take care of things right away. It's okay if you get angry when somebody legitimately trespasses against you, but look at verse 29. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You know what a talebearer is? That's corrupt communication. You know, somebody that's speaking words that wound people, that wound people deeply, that is corrupt communication. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, saying even the Holy Spirit inside you is going to be grieving if you do these things, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. But look at verse 31. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I'm going to read for you Hebrews chapter 12. You just keep looking at those two verses. It, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any, look what it says here, root of bitterness, springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Doesn't this all fit together perfectly, folks? If somebody trespasses against me legitimately, and then I wait and I don't take care of it in one of these two ways that I told you how to take care of it, the Bible says that immediately a root of bitterness starts to grow inside me. And the Bible, you're like, how fast does this root grow? The Bible says I better take care of it right away because the root of bitterness grows fast. It grows very quickly. If I start building a list with people, that bitterness root will grow and grow and grow. And you know what? Look at those last two words of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 31. All malice. You know what I'll do? That root of bitterness will grow into a malice tree. And you know what these things are in verse number 31? These things in verse number 31, they are the fruits of bitterness. And the fruits of bitterness come from a fully grown tree. You know what an option one, suffering yourself to defraud it, be defrauded does? And option two, going and talking to that person right away between him and him alone. You know what it does? It immediately plucks out that root. And it will not bear fruit. It immediately, you'll never have a bitterness tree. This is why you must keep a short list. And not only that, you must clear the list. What? Daily. Daily. This process pulls out the root so you will never have a malice tree. You know what malice is? Malice, the definition of malice is, is the, what is, it's, it's basically, how do I word this? It's like the, the willful, you want to do harm to somebody. If I have malice towards you, that means I want to harm you. You're like, wow, that sounds bad. But guess what? Once gossip starts, once this list starts to form, and it lasts longer than a day, two days, three days, then gossip comes in, then tailbearing comes in, then backbiting comes in. You just want to hurt these people. You just want to hurt these people. And you know what? You have a, you have a, you have a malice tree at this point. And the Bible says you're going you're gonna to hurt. Yeah, you're going to hurt that person, but you're also going to hurt all kinds of people that you suck into all these sins, these tailbearing sins backbiting sins, these railing sins. That means that root's grown into a full-blown tree. This, oh, by the way, by the way, this other person that you go and tail bear to, that can be your wife, too. Don't have a toxic marriage. That could be your husband, too. Just because you're married doesn't mean that as a, it says him and him alone. Just because you're married, don't have this toxic marriage where you go home and you just, just trash each other or trash people to each other. No, a marriage, 
And we'll talk about that in more detail tonight. But look, this is a toxic marriage. You can literally encourage each other to sin. You're like, well, he's my, he's my husband. What, what, what should I do? I'll, I'll give you details on that tonight. But here's the thing. Silence says a lot. Silence says a lot. Even if you're not in a position of authority over somebody that's trying to talk to you, silence says volumes. Instead of just getting it, yeah, you're right, that was bad. And just egging each other on. Look, there's many people that have toxic marriages, and just with their spouse, they betray Matthew 18. Just with their spouse. And they, between them and their spouse, they can grow a bit of the malice tree in their own home. They don't even need anybody else's help. That's a terrible marriage. It's talking about him and him alone and even your spouse. You can tail bear to your spouse. You can gossip and backbite and do all these things. And look, you make your, your spouse a sinner too. And especially as a man who's in charge of his household, in charge of his spouse, that's a terrible thing to do as a leader. So look, folks. If you cannot get this right, you will never have long-lasting relationships. This is the key here. In order to have relationships that last, I mean, think about your relationships. Think about your relationships, you know, what are relationships well, with my kids? You know, do you think, by the way, I know like many people here have young children, but do you think that it's just automatic that you're going to have a great relationship with your children their entire lives? That is not automatic. You will have to follow this process, and they will have to follow this process with you. Friends, church, the pastor, you need to clear all these lists. You need to have a short list and clear it daily, right away. Look, marriages. Think about marriages. Marriages, you know, this is really where the, the let the sun go down on your wrath. You can really see this in society today because, look, marriages, they don't, they don't, la- they don't, they don't end overnight. Marriages don't end in failure overnight. If you, know, you don't suffer yourself to be defrauded, if you don't confront issues in your marriage right away and, not, and, and don't let the sun go down on those things, you will build, look, people build lists against their own spouses. People build lists against each other. Those lists grow, that bitterness grows. And this is why you see, you know, you'll see divorced people that are just in these bitter battles. They just want to destroy the other person. You say, why? Because they both have just built up these malice trees. And just like, I just want to do everything to destroy him. I want to do everything to destroy her. Because it's a malice tree. Because what did they do? They didn't, pull, they didn't pluck the root out. They let the sun go down on their wrath. They built a huge list. They grew a huge tree. They became a sinner themselves by tailbearing and gossiping and backbiting, and they just fertilize that tree. And pretty soon, it's just like destroy each other. So if you ever wonder, like, have you ever seen that situation? I guarantee you, I could ask for a raise of hands. I won't. Everyone has seen that situation. And you've asked yourself, how could two people that were married for sometimes 20 years or more, how could two people that were married for 20 years had several children together, how could they have gotten into a situation where they literally like, want the other person to die? There's literally no person on the planet Earth that they hate more than that person that they spent 20 years of their life with. It's, it's because they, built a ma- they, they fed and they grew a malice tree. They didn't keep a short list. It's very simple. They followed the culture of today. So yeah, you know, throw the Bible off. Don't listen to the Bible. That's what you'll end up with if you listen to the way people are doing things today. So look, just learn to let things go. That's the first thing. Just to recap, just learn to let things go. If you can let it go, let it go. But I mean, really let it go. Really let it go. And look, it might be a way that you just might have to manage some of your friendships you know, like I said, you, maybe you just know there's some person that you shouldn't borrow money to. There's some person that you shouldn't borrow things to because they're not responsible with things. Manage your friendships that way so you can avoid these offenses. But just let things go. And then talk directly to the person. So easy. So easy. But bitterness, folks, just remember this. If you remember nothing else from this morning, is bitterness is a root that grows quickly. It grows quickly. So clear your lists the same day with your marriage, with your kids, with your friends, with your family, with your church family, especially. Please, please clear your lists right away. And then you know what? Your relationships will thrive. 
because there's nothing, and you know what? There's nothing better in your life. There's nothing better in your life than having friendships for years and years and years and years. There's nothing better in your life. Look, it may be the most, the best gift other than salvation and your children that God has given you may be a, a great marriage. But just because you're married doesn't mean you're going to have a great relationship. You could have a great relationship with your spouse. And that's an, that's an incredible blessing in what? In this life. God has provided so many ways for us to have all these things and them to be major blessings on our lives, from our friends to our spouses to our children. And he tells us, but those, like, these things don't happen on accident. You have to do these things. You have to get up and go talk to somebody on purpose. You have to purposely execute the Bible. And if you do it, look, if you do it, folks, if you listen to this sermon, tonight's sermon, and next week's two sermons, you're going to have great relationships in your life. But you have to do it on purpose. You have to execute, not just here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.